questions, thoughts? <clears throat> I have a I have a question about the smash wisdom vector. Um, nice name, by the way. I think that's, that's huge. Is that how similar is that to just a one way function? Is the one way function like used to produce it? So it's 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 not a one way function in the sense of uh, of you know cryptography, uh, where you are you know your goal is still to reduce the entropy. Uh, but make it make it um, make it irreversible in the context of machine learning. So, um, uh, you know, a classic one-way functions, you know, have theoretical guarantees. Uh, but here we're only giving you statistical guarantees, which is that, uh, let's say I take a picture. The common common examples we have are, I can take a picture and I can uh, send the image without being able to reveal the race or the gender, but I can reveal the expression. For example, right. So that's like a good, good kind of a visual way of thinking about it. Like if my machine learning algorithm only has to learn whether there's a smile or not, then I should have to reveal the gender or the race of the person, right? Um, and so we have shown many, you know, many examples uh, of that kind. Uh, going back to Melissa's point about, uh, sorry, Melissa, sorry, um, uh, Erin's point about it's funny the Zoom windows moved around, so Melissa is exactly where Erin was. <laughs> uh, Erin's point about you know uh, using smartwatches and so on. Um, uh, it turns out the ECG signal is you know just like your fingerprint. You can figure out who it is. You can figure out your gender, age, all kinds of things from your ECG signal. Uh, so if the only thing you want to know whether they are FE or not, you should be able to suppress all other features uh, and still be able to get the service. I have a question about. Oh, sorry, go, go ahead, Victor. Okay. Uh, I have a question about the scope of the contact tracing app because, as far as I can see, uh, it's limited as to like, uh, to as far as like two phones come in contact with each other, then it logs that information, for to till like one of the people are diagnosed, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, for example, let's say a person A on Tuesday that and that person spent a long time on a public a bench in a park. And two days later, that person was uh, diagnosed with uh, COVID-19, but that park bench was, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, used by a bunch of other people, but we have no idea who that is. So uh, what solutions uh, do we think like would allow for like uh, the contact tracing in that situation while also preserving uh, privacy. Um, maybe I missed your question. I was saying that if there's more than one person, will all of them get the exposure notification? Uh, no, but like, uh, I mean, as long if the two phone, if the people's phones never come in contact with each other, but they still interacted with the same like public space, right. uh, where like the droplets could have been, then uh, doesn't the contract tracing app kind of fail there? Uh, I mean, it's you're looking at proximity of phones, not proximity of people. Uh-huh. Right. So yes. if the two phones came sufficiently close to each other, then the tokens would be exchanged. The Bluetooth tokens would be exchanged. E even if they weren't in the same, oh, but like uh, they weren't in the same space at the same time. They have to be at the same place at the same point, same time within, within two meters. Okay. Uh, so, but in, if they weren't, then the, the app would not work, right? So the, the, if they were not close enough, let's say they were in a park and, but they were not close enough, then the Bluetooth signal strength will be too weak for the right. Uh, sorry, I, I think I framed my question uh, in, uh, not clearly enough. So, uh, let's say a person A used uh, a bench uh, at a park on Tuesday right. Uh, morning, right? Uh, and he perhaps uh, coughed on it or something and right. left droplets there. Oh yeah, uh, you mean like a format, like surface surface based uh, transfer? Yeah, you're right. So that's a problem. Even okay. if you came five minutes later, uh -huh. you know. The person was there, and, they, and and that will not be captured. You're right. Right. Oh, so that, that's a disadvantage. We could uh, perhaps. What do you think? Like, uh, if we could uh, leave, if the government could put like Bluetooth um, receivers at like commonly used public places, that could help solve the problem. No. Yeah. So you could. You're talking about like a, some kind of a repeater, some kind of a relay, right? You can yeah. capture all the Bluetooth tokens and and repeat them, mm -hmm. um, and. But come on, you are computer science students. You should be hacking the system. Just write an app 
that captures Bluetooth tokens and retransmits them all the time. So, you know, you can create misinformation and panic for fun, right? right? And demonstrate that this system needs to be better. So it's a pretty, pretty bare bones system. So you could write an app right now that, you know, captures all the signals and just transmits it back, you know, across the campus actually. Mm -hmm. So that even if the infected person never came in contact with somebody, the whole campus will get an alert the next day, right? right? So yeah, there are a lot of hacks you can imagine uh, uh, to do that. Or you can create a new app that a restaurant can uh, put in its window uh, and that shows an indicator of how many infected people have come to my shop. Right. Uh, so you could, you could do all kinds of interesting things with this, with this basic functionality. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I think if you, th if you think about a class project, uh, you know, think about all the different ways you could, I was, I'm partially joking about all the ways you can hack the system, <laughs> but you can also imagine some really beneficial things. Like if you know that hum, like the fact that every phone is going to be chirping these Bluetooth signals also allows you to ca calculate how many people are in a given room at any mm -hmm. given moment. It's like everyone's saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here with Bluetooth, right? Uh, and you could do that. You can figure out how many, you know, how long did one person stay uh, in a given place uh, and so on. So you could do all kinds of interesting projects, but maybe the more interesting one from a public health point of view is if you can write a server that can collect, uh, that can, in a privacy preserving way, collect information from all the smartphones and start creating some kind of a heat map that says, hey, it looks like in this poor neighborhood in Rochester, we're getting, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, cases. So, you know, there should be more testing facilities, more masks should be deployed there, mm. as opposed to on a fancy campus like yours, right? <laughs> right. Uh, because, you know, campuses are rich uh, and, you know, people who have, to, who have blue collar jobs and how to go to work, they're not getting the testing facilities, they're not getting the masks, they're not getting the sick leaves, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, and so on. So an awesome project would, would actually create, you know, a, a server that creates, uh, you know, this analytics uh, on top of, uh, top of uh, this existing apps. This app we, can, we, can work, we can work with our foundation because, you know, we can, you can write a module and we can implement that in real time mm -hmm. and hundreds of millions of people will use it if you, if you do it. Awesome. Thank you. Is the app currently collecting any location data on GPS so, coordinates? Yeah, good question, Curtis. So the, the Apple Google protocol does not allow you to record the location data. But what you can do is in the app, you can ask a person to provide something like saying, hey, listen, can you tell me your zip code? Or can you tell me which university you're from? Or things like that. So that's, that's, that's the module you can add as well. Is there also a functionality for the app that would because um, I'm pretty sure 15 minutes within six feet is like real serious exposure. Um, is there a mechanism in the application to identify users for like real high risk versus that one casual pass by example that we gave? A very good question. That's an excellent question. So you're right that the, the vanilla protocol right now is very simple. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, just calculate how, many, how long were you there? And if it's more than 15 minutes, then send an alert. Uh, you know, too close for too long. That's what they call it. Um, uh, but you're right that, you know, what if you were, uh, so, you know, we're all scientists here. Um, being close to an infected person for 15 minutes uh, within, uh, you know, six feet, is that the same as meeting 15 infected people for one minute each? I would say no. Why not? Um, well, you'd have to assume that it happened like right after the other, like in sequence. And that there was no, no, but let's say it's completely disparate. You know, all day long, you, have, you get one minute random slots for 15 people. I think no, because if you are within one person for that six feet, it would seem that there's more of a chance for a transmission of like air to be exchanged. Whereas like if you were just passing by someone for a minute, um, I don't think that it's a long enough duration to like have that be as, as serious of a risk. What do, what, do other, what do other people think? I mean, I think purely mathematically, it, it's, it's the same as long as you're, you're interacting with them at the same distance and the same space and all of those variables are the same. Um, yeah, because you're, there's some calculation of droplets expelled, droplets inhaled, um, and whether, it's the same person. Now, I guess it could be a little off because 
you're more likely to have a false positive in that 15 than you are in the one. Um, I think so you could potentially have a false positive and then that would decrease that 15 minute exposure down to 14 or 13? I think if you think that all other variables are the same, then these two scenarios are same, but you can never find 15 exact people because someone may be just getting the virus, someone is recovering, and uh, maybe someone is not wearing a mask, maybe someone is wearing a mask. So, uh, I mean, getting that exact scenario is going to be hard. So, in that situation, it's not going to be the two equivalent scenario. I think another perspective could be that, um, say, you're talking with someone for 15 minutes versus you're meeting 15 different people for one minute each. I think the second case has more risk because uh, statistically out of the 15 people, um, there will be a higher chance of the virus, you know, existing than just the one person because, you know, having one minute or 15 minutes should not matter uh, if the person is infected, right? Um, so I think meeting 15 people might be more uh, risky here. Yeah. Just to add one perspective, like does the like the strains may differ, like from one person to other, the viral load transfer, or like the particular strain that that person has that can be more susceptible towards you, and so on. So if if that part differs, and then if the viral load transmission is different due to that, like the part of the particular strain of virus that you have, then then maybe it can be different. Mm -hmm. Michael, you want to add something? Um, I couldn't possibly answer this question without knowing more about the infection mechanism. Right. Uh, I, I don't know whether it's um, linear with time or not. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I think mathematically speaking, I'm with Aaron. If you treat them as, you know, IID, completely independent events, then you can just multiply those probabilities the same, whether it's one person 15 minutes or 15 people one minute each. Uh, but uh, uh, who was it who said that uh, in, uh, was it, was it Wasifur? I, I'm sorry if I'm getting, or maybe it's Rayan who said that um, in, in the population, when it's a post distribution of how many people are infected, then clearly the likelihood of meeting, it's like a lottery ticket, right? Meeting one infected person versus 15, at least, at least one of those people being infected versus 15, one of the 15 people being infected is higher. So, so you know, it, it's a distribution of how many people in the town are infected, right? Anyway, these apps don't do that. None of these things that we talked about, you know, the traditional public health, if you talk to public and people in medicine, they're like, you know what? As long as a person 15 minutes, six feet, that's all we have. But they don't think about this from a mathematical point of view, and especially the point of view that Ryan, you brought in about it being a post on distribution as well, right? <laughs> I would argue that that one person you're spending 15 minutes with at one time, perhaps you're a little bit more intimate with, and that the transmission could be higher. <laughs> yeah, good. But uh, did everybody join? Was people people able, able to join the Slack channel? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, feel free to post these questions in the general general Slack Slack channel. And uh, if you're looking, I mean, Hassan was saying, you know, if you're early in the semester right now, I'm guessing you're thinking about class projects and so on. To me, if you're not working on a COVID-19 project, you're playing piano on the Titanic. <laughs> you, know, nice you, know, you know that story, right? Everyone knows that story of piano on Titanic? Yes. So don't play piano on the Titanic. You have the opportunity to save yourself and save everybody on that ship. So right now, for the last six months, I can't imagine doing anything else in my life, but spending every minute I have to use my skills to do something about this crisis. One question I have for Ramesh is that we had an early start. A lot of states, com countries are using it, but not, it's not well adapted or not effective everywhere. So I just want to learn about your experience as you're have this nonprofit rolling it out in different cities. What are the things you have learned? What are the difficulty? Uh, if you have a next pandemic, what are the things we should watch out for from now on? Very good question, Hassan. 
I think, you know, like we were, of course, very naive and very idealist. And we thought like, we we'll launch it. States will say, awesome. This is so great. We're all going to deploy it and we'll save lives, right? And we have hundreds of people who joined us, like really professional people, you know, really talented people who joined us on that mission. Uh, the reality is um, that I still believe it's the best idea. Using technology to nudge people to do the right things is the best way to tame this pandemic. It's going to be better than testing, better than vaccines. Uh, you know, it's going to be better than a lot of the other things we're doing. Uh, I think a lot of the models have shown that um, using contact tracing apps is as effective as using masks. The combination of the two can, um, so just to just make sure I get the, status, uh, get the status across right. So everybody knows about R0, which is how many people you would infect on average, that's about 2.5. If you use masks, it can come down by a factor of five. Okay, so it will go down to 0.5, which means the you know, pandemic will disappear just with masks alone. If you have 80% uh, penetration of mask usage, not 100%, even 80% is good enough. Um, if you use a contact tracing app, 80% penetration, the same effect. The pandemic can come down by a factor of five, which is R0 can go down to 0.5. And if R0 is below one, then the pandemic disappears, right? Because the diminishing um, uh, uh, spread. If you use a combination of the two, masks and contact tracing, only 80% acceptance, it can come down by a factor of 10. So only R, sorry, not 10, by 30. So R not of only 0.1, okay? And it can disappear overnight. Remember, no social distancing, no frequent testing, masks and contact tracing alone. So, you know, the simulations show that, a lot of underlying data shows that, this is not our paper, this paper from other groups. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of hope we, if, we, if we do this right. Um, but I think it's difficult to convince, you know, states and nations that digital technology has such a big, such a powerful impact on, on things that are out there. Uh, you know, I, was, I was in the congressional, sorry? We can't convince them that masks do. Exactly. So it's you know it's it's very difficult to difficult to kind of get that message across, which is kind of disappointing if you think about it, such a low tech, you know, intervention. Just a stupid app and masks. I mean, we don't need to, you know, you know we don't lose trillions of dollars sort of economic value. You know, the apps are like the total cost of the apps to deploy across the country is fifty million dollars. In the last class, we talked about how the different states are having intervention to combat this. And Erin mentioned that the Hawaii, the state of the art technology is the fax machine. They send people fax um, that you have been infected. So that's where we are in terms of technology use. 